Kevin, it's all you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today we're going to be talking about plant health care, but specifically mostly about preventative plant health care. Um, a lot of people tend to react to the problems that are, are kind of right in front of them and what's going on and what they can see, but they don't really dig in a little deeper to find out what the cause of that problem might have been. And, you know, with that preventative plant health care, um, you know, we can avoid a lot of issues to begin with. If you were on the webinar a couple of weeks ago that I did, some of this is going to be um, a, a little bit of the same as what we went over there, but it's going to go a lot more in depth and have a few other new topics also in there. Uh, that being said, so why preventative health care is better than therapeutic? There's, um, you know, many reasons that um, getting ahead of the problem is, is better than kind of waiting for it to happen. So when it comes to trees going into decline, normally when we get involved is when a homeowner calls because the tree already looks bad. Um, and that's when it's in that inner, inner area of this uh, death spiral. It's, it's the cankers, it's the wood boring insects, you know, root rot, um, you know, the viruses that tend to attack these weaker trees. But typically there's, there's inciting factors that, that cause these issues. And a lot of times those inciting factors are even brought on by, by predisposing factors like the urban environment is very stressful for trees. It's not where they naturally want to be. Um, trees evolved in the forest where, you know, there's a lot of biological activity in the soils. There's a lot of, you know, protection from other trees. Um, you know, just, it's, it's a lot different of an environment than when we take them and plant them in the middle of our front yard, um, under grass, mowing around them, fertilizing the lawn. Um, so that urban environment is very stressful. Uh, there's genetic potential in trees. They're all very different. You know, not every red oak is going to grow the same. So, you know, especially in the Northeast in the last couple hundred years, because here everything was pretty much clear cut for farming about a hundred years ago. And a lot of areas are clear cut for lumber. Often the trees that were selected and left for seed trees were to the genetically weaker trees. They weren't the best growing, um, you know, multi or multi stem trees that weren't the best for lumber. So, you know, the trees now also are just a little genetically weaker because the, the best of the species were selected for, for harvesting back, back in the early, uh, earlier days. Soil compaction, that's a, that also falls into the urban environment. Um, I'd say that's probably one of the most common problems that I see around the nor Northeast with sick trees is, is, um, is soil compaction. It's, it's commonly overlooked and there's not a lot of, and people usually, um, you know, air spade or it, it's a tough situation to fix if you don't, um, you know, kind of do a lot of amendments and things. So moving on from that, you know, other things that can be inciting factors would be, you know, excessive salts on trees near driveways or on the side of the road. Um, so, you know, kind of working with these outer rings is, is a lot easier. It's a lot less expensive. It's a lot less labor. Um, and, uh, you know, it avoids those problems that are actually going to kill the tree. You know, these things on the outside, soil compaction usually is the inciting factor, but it's not what actually finishes the tree off. So if we can just take away those initial stresses, we're good to go. Uh, the other thing that's good about it is it's a lot more socially acceptable because it's, uh, it's not really by using pesticides by maintaining trees. You're maintaining it through um, soil management or, you know, just keeping the tree better able to defend itself. So it's kind of that, you know, hot button word with a lot of people. They don't want to hear the word pesticide or they only want to use organics. Um, so avoiding to have the need to use those things that people are just against in nature um, will help save a lot more trees. So a lot of times if we can get away from those, those things like those, you know, those hot topic issues, especially like neonicotinoids, if we can keep things healthy and not need to use those more, um, people are a lot more accepting of our programs. And it's also, it's very important with preventative healthcare for trees to get to of, um, you know, big giant mature status. I mean, these are pretty inspiring trees when you walk up to them, you know, it kind of changes the way you feel. It kind of inspires you to be a better arborist when you walk up on these giants. And they, they wouldn't be here if they weren't you know, just generally healthy. That tree on the left there, the Pincho Sycamore, that one's starting to get stressed out. It's at a public boat launch. The soil is very compacted, uh, but it is a town owned tree. So it's, uh, you know, not a lot of budget for that one at all. But, you know, you can see back in the day, that tree is about 400 years old. It was, it evolved just in a floodplain on the side of the river where sycamores love to be. And, and that's one of the reasons that tree was able to get so large. But now you can see a nice road was built on the left. There's a big bank, it lost some root zone. So that's something that's starting to have a lot more stress from anthracnose than a sycamore typically would. Uh, you know, it's not growing as well as it used to. So, you know, that's a good candidate to kind of put some mulch down, decompact that soil, and, and just get that back to a little bit of a happier place. Uh, that tree on the right is 
That is a, a pen oak, it's a white oak. Um, just named the pen oak because when William Penn found Pennsylvania, he uh, used to give people land and they had to clear cut it to be farms. And you know, if people left a tree for, uh, this one was left for religious purposes, they built a church near it. You know, it's called a pen oak because it survived William Penn's order to cut it down. Again though, you know, this tree, if it wasn't taken care of and able to take care of itself, it wouldn't get to that mature status. And, and that's why just general healthy trees are necessary because we need a world where these larger iconic trees exist because that's what inspires people to become arborists, I, I believe. You know, if we live in a world of, of 10 inch red maples and, and oak trees, it's just, it's not that impressive of, a, of an industry. You know, we need these large, large mature trees to keep the, keep the spirit alive. So compacted soils, um, you know, one of the biggest things to think about with compacted soil is why it's compacted. And that makes a big difference in, in what you're going to do to fix it and, you know, how many approaches you're going to put together. If that soil is compacted because it's foot traffic, it's in a park, um, it's because lawn care equipment's on it, you know, that's something that's going to take a little more work because when you decompact it, if you don't change anything, the same thing is going to happen again. You know, that foot traffic is still going to be the same. It's going to you know, it's just going to keep recompacting. Um, if it's from, you know, a uh, construction project and, you know, it's just heavy machinery, if you decompact that soil, add a little organic matter, then you're not, it's not going to recompact because the construction's over, it's done. So that's, you know, that's an easier situation to work with. Um, so ways to decompact the soil are going to be air spades, mulch, um, and just changing that soil composition to, to, you know, be a little more organic. So the pros of air spading is it's, it's very fast results. Um, you know, that, that soil is decompacted immediately. Once you, you know, loosen it up and everything, it's, it's nice and, you know, aerated over the soil. It's easy to add in amendments at that time since you're already mixing everything together. You know, as you're, as you're blowing it around, you can get, um, you know, organic matter in there. You can get biochar in there easier. Um, you know, customers can see the work was done, which is always a, always a pro. With plant health care, there's so many things that we do that really leaves no visual evidence. So, you know, it's, it's nice sometimes to be able to have something to show for your work, you know, especially with, you know, tree injections, besides seeing that there's a little plug in the base of the tree, you know, you wouldn't really know something was done. Um, and it's fun. You know, I, en I enjoy air spading quite a bit. It's, it's kind of neat to, to get underground and, and really see what the trees are up to down there. It's, it was always funny, you know, when I was a kid growing up, when I was, you know, five, six years old, it was always that old tale that trees looked exactly the same underground as they did above. And you know, as you grow up and learn more about tree biology and things like that, you realize those trees, there's just a completely different world underground than it is above. And often that's where most of the problems start. Uh, the cons of aerospading is the equipment's expensive if you want to um, own all the equipment yourself. The compressors for aerospading can cost $20,000 plus. So it's usually something that you would rent um, rather than own unless you do a lot of landscaping. Um, skilled labor, you need somebody that knows what they're doing. You know, air spading is not always just about loosening the soil. If, if you run into girdling roots or other issues or root rot issues, you, know, you need somebody that's skilled enough to, um, to see that, you know, to really see what's going on and, and diagnose the issue and, and handle it at that time. You know, you don't want to have it covered up and then, you know, have somebody come back to the shop and say, yeah, it's all of a sudden there was a little weird, we're probably going to want to dig that up again. It's better to just have skilled labor do it and, and get it done in one shot. And, the, the effects could be temporary if that's, uh, if all you're doing is loosening the soil and it's still in a park, there's still going to be a lot of foot traffic. It's just going to recompact. You're not going to have permanent effects. Kevin, while you're, while you're talking about compaction, mm -hmm. um, what about compaction that that's pretty, you know, a little bit deeper in the soil, somewhere around like a foot deep? Did, would they, would an air spade help out with that or do you need a different tool? Um, you could air spade deeper than a foot. Um, you know, generally that, you know, top eight inches is where most of those, um, you know, feeder roots are going to be. So if you decompact that upper soil and then, you know, add some, some mulch and, and things of that nature, it'll naturally decompact lower than that. Um, it's pretty tough to compact soil past that usually in your front yard, though. It, it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of weight. Okay. And then what, what about if the, the soil that far down um, is some pretty crummy stuff, like it's full of rock and gravel? Any, anything that, uh, any tools that would help out with that? Um, I mean, that just could end up being, you know, if you have a really poor soil that's, that's stone and gravel below the tree, you know, you just got to think about, you know, right tree, right place. Um, 
and, and you know, maybe pick a different species to be in the area that's not going to get so large if, if they need to get roots that deep. But there's not much you can do if the soil composition is all stone and rock six feet down. You kind of just have to work with uh, what you have in that scenario. Awesome, thanks. All right, so mulch is, um, you know, another way that you can decompact soil. Um, and this is just by increasing biological activity, um, you know, worms going up and down, all that, uh, you know, the natural fungi in the soil breaking it down. And that'll naturally decompact over time. Uh, it may take several years, but the, you know, the pros of it is it's a low material cost to put mulch down. Uh, it's low labor, it's fast, it's something customers can see. Um, but it makes permanent changes. So if there's a lot of foot traffic, you know, if there's mulch on top of it, you're going to reduce the compaction of that foot traffic by having the mulch there. Uh, it's going to retain better moisture in the soil. It's going to, um, you know, add, add that organic matter that's going to, you know, hold more moisture, hold more nutrients to exchange. Um, the cons are sometimes customers don't prefer mulch beds. They prefer grass. They want their lawn. Um, so kind of you have to talk them into it. But with, with the mulch beds, you get to plant a, a diverse landscape. You can, you can add flowering ornamentals. You can add some shrubs. And you can attract a lot more beneficial insects to the area also, which are going to take some other stresses off plants. Um, you know, for instance, if you have aphid problems on, a, on some, of your, some of your, say they're in your garden or, you know, they, they tend to be all over my lupins all the time. Um, you know, the green lacewing is a great beneficial insect, the larvae from that against aphids. But as an adult, they like to feed on nectar and pollen. So you have to have, you know, late season flowers to have that early season uh, beneficial. So the mulch bed gives you good opportunity to plant more diverse plantings and, and attract those, those beneficials. So being that mulch can take a long time to decompact soil if that's all that you put down, uh, there are ways to kind of speed up the benefits of that mulch to get it to decompact the soil faster. And, and that would be by, by kind of feeding the microbes in the soil. There's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, theory back and forth on, you know, some people like to add mycorrhizae to the soil. Um, they put it in with their fertilizer and they put it down there. But, you know, if you think about it, there's already mycorrhizae in the soil or the tree would, the tree would most likely be dead. You know, that's a symbiotic relationship the tree needs. So if you want more mycorrhizae, you really need to think about adding more food for the mycorrhizae. You know, what they eat is the, they take carbohydrates from the tree and, the, and they process that. And that's, you know, that's, that's what they get. So if we can just add more carbohydrates to the soil and give them more food, they're going to naturally um, expand their population. So if you're just sitting there adding more, more fungi to the soil, but you're not giving them anything to eat, that population really can't take off. So you're better off um, feeding those fungi than just adding more um, you know, or both if you want to. But really, it's about getting more, um, more food source in the ground for them. You know, and that's going to help that mulch break down faster. Uh, you can add humic acids in the short term. Um, what humic acid does basically is, is almost like it gives you the benefits of organic matter where you don't have a lot of organic matter. So if you put that in a sandy or a clay soil, it's going to give it better water retention, uh, better nutrient holding capacity. So when you put that mulch down, if you add humic acid at the same time, the soil is going to start acting like that mulch is already broken down and buy you that couple, couple of seasons before that organic matter is actually there. So that's kind of a faster way to kind of trick the tree into thinking everything's amended a little sooner. And then, you know, in the long run, it, you do get those, those longer effects. <clears throat> so using things like seaweed extracts, humates, and plant growth regulators is, you know, is an, is an exceptional way of, of taking care of trees early before things go downhill. And even using these things, once you treat a tree therapeutically to to then get them out of that spiral and keep them on the uh, keep them on the healthy side. So seaweed extracts have been used in in farming for hundreds of years in the Northeast. Um, you know the Native Americans used these, and there's a lot of cytokines in, in North Atlantic kelp, especially, and and this improves you know root growth. It boosts the antioxidant levels in the leaf tissue. Um, you you have uh, better root viability, and you get improved drought and heat tolerance. So, you know, back in the, in the day, they used to just put this on the, on, the, uh, on the fields and then just till it in. So it was good organic matter, but now we can better understand why tilling in of that, um, of that seaweed worked so well for the, for the local farms out here in the Northeast. 
So back to the, uh, the carbohydrates. Uh, this is a product that we have that is a, um, a liquid additive. It's a BioMP. So this is a molasses-based carbohydrate. And this is what we use when we want to um, you know, speed up the benefits of that, of that mulch, mulch decomposition and increase that microbial activity. Uh, so this is really going to help improve plant vigor, especially where there's you know, heavy soils and uh, poor microbial activity. <clears throat> Enviroplex is our humic acid, which is um, you know, 22%. So it's got a pretty good, pretty good amount in it, but it's not um, a lot of other stuff. So this is a great additive to whatever your fertility program is to get that, get that humic acid in there for those sandy soils and soils lacking in uh, organic matter. So this is just going to improve the structure, increase the availability of nutrients, um, and it's good for the compacted areas because it's going to really help the tree survive until those areas are, are amended. Cytogrow is our uh, seaweed extract product. So this has <clears throat> all the cytokinins in there and it is registered. So it's a guaranteed analysis with the Cytogrow. There are some states where Cytogrow is not registered like New York and California. And then it's um, C extra is the product that could be used there. But this has, um, you know, all those, all those benefits for trees. It's going to improve, improve, um, root growth, you know, drought stress, new plantings, establishment, you know, a, a lot of benefits to adding these um, seaweed extracts to plants. And here is um, Arborplex. So this is our general tree fertilizer as a 14, four or five. And if you do need to use nitrogen um, to fertilize trees, you know, this is, is, is a good one to go for because it's mostly slow release. But the best thing about this is this one's a, a liquid. And, you know, so it's easy to tank mix. You don't need mechanical agitation. And it easily um, <clears throat> can be worked in with that Enviroplex, the BioMP, the Cytogrow. You know, all these products can just be tank mixed together. They work very well. So you can kind of tailor your, your programs to the specific needs of the site, which is really what, you know, everybody wants to do. There's no blanket statement of, of one thing fixes all. You know, we have to deal with every, every site individually, just like, you know, every person needs their own. Um, you know, different medical plan with their doctor. You know, there's not, there's not one thing everybody can do to stay healthy. Here's another product we have, which is um, NutriRoot. Uh, and this is kind of a, a blend of a lot of those products already together, uh, especially for transplanting, uh, for drought problems, for plant establishment. And this has the, the seaweed extracts in it already. It has some iron, it has surfactants, and it has um, humectants in it. And what the humectants do also on top of all those other benefits um, is, you know, they help by attracting and condensing soil vapor in the, in the soil profile and recondensing that so it's available for the tree. Um, you know, in the, in the summer, you know, we might get some, you know, rain one day, but the next day it's really hot and dry and it's going to start to evaporate that water and pull it out of the soil. And those humectants are going to help, you know, capture that vapor and, and hold it down to not uh, dry out so fast. So the combination of all these things together is uh, really going to improve uh, nutritional defici deficiencies in the soil, um, reduce that moisture stress, and really give that chance a better uh, plant, a better chance of, of survival in the end. <clears throat> so this is kind of just a, uh, you know, a chart that we, that we have to put together to kind of just a, you know, a quick overview of what you can mix in and what scenarios would, would go to well together. You know, if you look at the, uh, you know, the Enviroplex, which is the humic acid, you know, it's, it's very good for general maintenance, sandy soils, clay soils, <clears throat> you know, but if you don't have those problems and you have more of a problem with iron deficiency, you could use, add the iron plus to the Arborplex, and, you know, and that would be a better solution. So it's kind of just a, a good, uh, like a little cheat sheet to look at on what products of these we can pick and choose from to tailor these to these sites specifically. So here's some plants that were treated with, with NutriRoot in the, um, in one of our one of our growing areas, and you can see with those those untreated roots on the left, they're smaller, they're they're of a lesser color, they're they're unhealthy, and that that plant on the right has a much more um, even root system, and and the reason that is is a lot of times even in, in a you know when we plant in a yard, trees are pretty adventitious. The roots are going to grow to where there's better soil, there's going where there's better soil quality. If there's more, you know, oxygen or nutrients available on one side of the tree than the other, the roots are going to go that way. And, you know, you know, to the other side, if there's compacted soil with not a lot of nutrients on the other side, there's not going to be a lot of root there. But if we use, you know, these, these products like NutraRoot um, and the seaweed extracts and the molasses or, you know, any of these additives, 
and make that soil a little more attractive to the plant, those roots are going to grow in all the different directions and eventually get past those, you know, small pockets that are of poor quality into the, you know, the areas of soil on the other side and get a much more, you know, established root zone in the end, you know, and that's what's going to help that tree, um, you know, go on for 50, 100, 200 years, um, is that nice, healthy root system that they establish when they're young. You know, if they don't get off to a good start in the beginning, it's, trees can be a fight for a long time. And, you know, starting with smaller trees when you plant is also a, uh, a great idea in preventative plant health care, you know, preventing that stress of the initial planting. Um, a lot of times, if you start off with a one or two inch diameter tree, instead of trying to plant a five inch diameter tree, um, you know, inside of 10 years, that one or two inch tree is probably going to be of, of better quality and, and surpass the, the size of that five, 10 inch tree. So, you know, kind of working with your customers and, and having them understand those things is beneficial. That, that patience is, is a big part of um, preventative health care. <clears throat> so establishment, like I was saying, is the, is the single most important factor um, in tree health, survivability, and, and longevity. And the most important aspect of that is, is, is usually water. So again, that's where the, the surfactants and the humectants of, of NutraRoot are, are going to be beneficial. You know, they're going to help um, moisture change between those soil profiles, between, you know, what the root ball may be made of to the backfill and the, and the native soil. So that's going to allow those, uh, those roots to reach out quite a bit better. Drought survival, another thing that, you know, we're all very familiar with in, uh, in our plantings is once it gets to those summer months, you know, we like to plant in spring or fall. And then it's kind of up to the homeowners to uh, take care of those trees through the summer most often, unless it's part of the contract to, to take care of the watering. But trusting them to do that is, is tough. So anything we can do to you know, by using those, um, those humectants to take the, the stress off of them and the stress off of us having to replace that tree if they don't water it um, is of great benefit. You know, that first year is, is the hardest on them. If we can get them through that, um, typically they're a lot better off. The general rule of thumb in planting is uh, for every inch in diameter the tree is at planting, uh, it takes a year of care. So, you know, one inch diameter tree would take about a year to establish. A five inch diameter tree would take about five years of care to establish. Um, and that's just a rule of thumb. But again, another benefit to planting younger trees is, is that speed of establishment. Poor growing conditions. Again, this is a, a lot of times when trees get planted, they're planted in very poor conditions. Um, you know, sidewalk trees, parking lot trees, um, parks where there's a lot of foot traffic or pets. Um, you know, that's not where they wanna be like we discussed earlier. So, you know, that's where we have to work with these things, these sandy soils, they, um, you know, they have terribly, terrible water holding capacity, uh, restricted areas, you know, a lot of heat in those parking lots. So that's a great time to use, um, you know, you know, all these soil, soil amendments to kind of get these things a little happier, a lot healthier, and, and deal with those stresses. You know, without nutrients and a lot of heat and compacted soil, the tree's basically a goner. Um, you know, we've all seen, uh, you know, the, the parking lot trees, you know, around here at the, you know, at the supermarkets, we get a lot of you know, Zelkovas or, or sometimes they plant cherries, but they always end up just loaded with, uh, with scale, you know, and they're just, the trees are just so stressed. They, they collapse within a few years and look pretty bad, but you know, with proper, proper management, you can, you can keep those going a bit, a bit longer, um, especially with plant growth regulators, which we'll get into a little later on in the, uh, the discussion. But all these soil applied products, um, you know, there's lots of methods to, uh, to get these down. They're not, they're not complicated. Um, <clears throat> They're all just, you can typically soil inject them like any, you know, deep root feeding. Um, you can soil drench. I know and with, with planting, you know, your, your application equipment's a bucket. You know, you're just mixing it right in that, uh, that five gallon bucket, drenching the base of the tree. And, and that's about it. Um, you can tanks mix and, and, and spray some of them. Um, and there's also hose end sprayer options for, you know, like the neutral root, if you wanted to get that, give it to the homeowner and say, you know, once a month, apply this to your new hedge and you'll have uh, you know, a lot better results. How'd you actually give a homeowner something in their hand for them to do? They're actually more likely to do it than just trying to remember to, to water in just generally. So there's lots of ways to get these, these products down. So now moving on to plant growth regulators. Um, these, uh, the benefits are, are, are far beyond what I think anybody expected when these came out, you know, back in the 70s. Uh, you know, originally they were trying to make a systemic fungicide and ended up seeing the plant growth um, benefits of it. 
So for a long time, that's how they were used, you know, crab apples, um, you know, river birch out of the power lines, you know, reducing that growth by, you know, 60, 70% in some cases. But now we're really starting to realize um, those trees are a lot just healthy and a lot healthier in general. So we, we've started to, to put some more science behind that and look into, into the whys. Um, our plant growth regulator is short stuff. It's a paclobutrazole based product. Um, and what this does is it, is, it, is it lowers the amount of gibberellic acid in the plant and increases the amount of abscisic acid. Uh, so in a little bit, we'll talk about how that affects the tree. Um, you still get the, you know, with this plant growth regulator, which is a, um, a type two, it reduces cell elongation. So you still get the same amount of plant cells, you have the same amount of leaves, same amount of flowers, but the internodal growth of the, uh, of the, of the, of the uh, branch is, is much less. And the benefit of that is all that leftover energy from not putting so much energy into the, the shoot growth is they have a lot more energy for, uh, you know, defense compounds, uh, yeah, root growth, and uh, all sorts of other good things. So you can apply plant growth regulators anytime during the growing season. Uh, pretty much whenever the tree's transpiring, you know, you can get these down. Uh, the first year response is, is, is usually a little slower. If you put this down in the spring, you know, it's not really gonna affect the growth of the tree that year. It has to get into the buds to affect, um, you know, how those cells are gonna react that season. So if you put it down in the summer or fall, you'll get good control the next spring. But if you put it down in the spring, you won't see it until the next season. Um, but that second year on certain species, you can have up to an 85% reduction in growth. Uh, but really it's that, what it does is it, it thickens the leaf cuticle. So, you know, that's how a lot of the benefits are seen. Up here in the uh, Northeast, we get about three years out of it in Southern New England, four years in uh, Northern New England, Northern Vermont, and Maine. Down in Florida, it's one to two years. And this is just based on the growing season. The more growing trees do, the faster they use this product. Uh, we have a much shorter growing season up here, so we get a lot more, uh, a lot more longevity out of it. Here's just some you know, images on, on how it affects oak growth. You can see it reduces that growth by about 60% year over year, um, you know, year before treatment to year after. And you can see it gets a much darker leaf. You get a much healthier chlorophyll. Um, you know, so they, they actually look a lot more, um, a lot more robust as well. Here's the uh, internodal growth on red maple from treated year to untreated. You can see still same amount of um, buds there, same amount of leaf you're gonna have, just a lot closer together. You know, a lot less, lot less outward growth. So it's a suspended concentrate. It's a clay-based carrier. So. Basically, you just have to, um, you know, we mix this for a, a basal drench application, you know, one part shortstop, 11 parts water. And that's pretty much standard for every tree. And then the amount of that solution is based, um, what you would use is based on the species of tree, which, um, you know, that comes with a chart that you would follow for that. But how it works is it gets up, soil applied, goes up through the tree, and it gets into the, um, the apical meristems. And there it kind of hangs out. And what it does is, you know, as that shoot, as that bud opens and goes to expand in the spring, it lessens the elongation by lowering the gibberellic acid and increases the abscisic acid. And that's what's going to have the effect on those thicker leaves, the more chlorophyll, uh, the fibrous roots, and the defense compounds. And these are where we see the health benefits of this over just the growth regulation. Those thicker leaves are going to have a great effect on things like, um, you know, apple scab. Uh, it's a lot less vulnerable of a host. It's less suitable for that, that fungi to take hold and take over. Um, you know, with evergreens, we see that that thicker cuticle causes less winter desiccation. So, you know, our spruces here where we get a lot of needle cast issues, you know, some of the big points of infection in the spring for that, you know, in the spring rain splashes the infection back up into the tree and it's getting into little cracks from winter desiccation um, and reinfecting the plant. So that thicker cuticle um, allows for, you know, less cracking and less winter des desiccation. So you'll get less um, reinfection areas. And with those more fibrous roots, you're gonna have a lot more drought tolerant tree, which is gonna lower the stress as well. Um, you know, the more fibrous roots they have, the more water and nutrients are available to the plant uh, for a given area. <clears throat> so the tree energy theory, this is just kind of average tree, average, average theory on how they use their energy. Um, mostly it goes into shoot growth, reproduction, um, and then root, root growth and defense compounds. And, uh, you know, and this is, this is just, the way trees evolve. This is, this is the forest theory that they have. Um, shoot growth was the most important thing. You know, when trees grew in the forest, they had to grow up and get to the sun as fast as possible and claim a piece of the sky. 
Um, you know, that was just the reality of it. If they didn't get to the sun, they wouldn't make it as a tree. Uh, reproduction, you know, survival of the species, they had to put a lot of energy into that. But now that we don't need these trees competing for light, we've generally taken them out of the forest. The trees we care for are urban or ornamental. So that excessive shoot growth just isn't something they need the dry for. You know, we take that energy away and allow them to use it in a different bucket, so to say. Uh, just because that dominance of the sky is not an aspect of what will affect their health. You know, they already have all the sun they'll need in an ornamental scenario. So with the addition of plant growth regulators, you can see that shoot growth comes way down and that allows the energy to go much higher in the uh, fine root growth and defense compounds especially. Um, and these defense compounds are, you know, extremely important in the tree defending themselves when, when attacked. You know, they can, they can produce, um, you know, insecticides themselves, just like um, tobacco has nicotine, which is an insecticide, for instance. And that's where, you know, neonicotinoids are just a synthetic nicotine that we came up with that was safer for humans. But, you know, that's, that's an insecticide that produces naturally. Um, you know, it's chrysanthemum flowers, some chrysanthemum flowers produce insecticides also. So trees can defend themselves when they're healthy. You know, every tree has a, has a different chemical they can produce, but when they're healthy, they can produce more of it. You know, pine trees, for instance, you know, pitch is one of their um, self-protection methods. You know, you get a bark boring insect, as soon as that gets into the, gets into the tree, it's gonna try to flush it out with pitch. The healthier it is, the more pitch it has, the better luck it's gonna have flushing that out and not being overcome by an attack. You're also gonna see a little bit reduced diameter growth. Um, a lot of times this is important in, in street trees because you'll see they're planted in these, uh, these little sidewalk areas and those rings are supposed to be cut out as the tree grows, but often they're not. So by reducing that diameter growth, you're gonna get a lot more life out of that tree. Um, you know, in a, in a lot of city environments, 10, 15 years is a, you know, an average expectation for a new planting. So if you can even extend that to 25, 30 years to the life of a street planting, um, you know, that, that tree's gonna be there a lot longer. It's gonna expand your budget to do a lot more other plant healthcare, uh, plant healthcare work in other areas uh, of your program. <clears throat> It's also great to have reduced diameter growth if you have people that plant, uh, not plant, but or have their decks in around trees. You know, my grandparents have a, have a little lake house up in Maine. And one of the best parts about that house is a giant oak tree that grows out of the deck and, you know, kind of shades the, shades the area overlooking the pond. But every few years they have to redo the deck, cut out the boards. And, you know, with a growth regulator, you can, you know, slow that diameter growth down, have a healthier tree. So it gets to be there a lot longer and uh, lessen those construction costs. Also tree houses, another area where, you know, slower diameter growth would be beneficial. Some, some of these tree houses people buy nowadays or have built are twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000. So keeping those trees as healthy as possible for as long as possible is extremely important. You know, those are, are trees where, uh, you know, if you have a lot of these in your customer list, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll put the money into saving those ones and doing a little preventative care. <clears throat> Uh, Kevin, before you move on to that, there was a, a question about um, combining soil aeration with growth regulators. Have, what, are you, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, you know, if, if you, you know, use, it depends on why the tree's in decline, but yeah, if you have a compacted soil, um, you can use a growth regulator to get that tree a little more hardy and then, yeah, aerate the soil. That, that, that would be beneficial if, if done at the same time in that scenario. All right, so the uh, increased drought resistance you can see here in Denver, um, one year to the next. This is a, a similar weather pattern from year to year. And you can see that just um, that burning on the outer edge of the leaves as that, you know, as that drought stress, that's a common drought stress symptom uh, versus the tree to tree with that, with that thicker cuticle on the leaf, they're allowed to slow transpiration much, much better. Um, and with that fine root growth, just have better stores of moisture. So they, they tolerate those droughts better. Um, and even now with just a, with the climate change, droughts are a little more common. And even in just that micro drought scenario where we may get our average amount of rain in a season, um, but it may come in, in small bursts less frequently. You know, we may say we average three inches of rain in July. That may end up just being one weekend on a thunderstorm and then it doesn't rain for three weeks. So even if we get our average rainfall, we can still end up in a drought condition, uh, which is what we see more often now with, um, with the climate changing. Cytoscara canker on blue spruce, another common issue. 
Um, and with the, uh, with the application of shortstop, that paclobuzazole product, you're going to see less of a, a, a prevalence of this. It's not going to have that same effect on the tree, having that, that healthier, just better able to defend itself species. Sycamore anthracnose, this is another one that's great to use um, plant growth regulators on. You know, it kind of goes back and forth between, you know, stem lesions to, to the leaf tissue and then back to the stem. So it goes back and forth on the same plant, different parts of the plant throughout the season. So by making the leaf a less susceptible host to it, you can interrupt that cycle. And, and we get great beneficial uh, results on growth regulators and sycamore anthracnose. And, you know, up here in the north, especially where we can get three years out of one application, you know, the other options for treatment would be, you know, tree injection. Um, which you'd have to do depending on the product every year, every other year, or if you were doing foliar applications, you're probably spraying that tree three or four times every spring, depending on how, how cool, damp, and drawn out it is. So doing one soil drench, uh, basically applied every three years versus three or four sprays a year or, or multiple injections in the same time period, you know, this, this is a pretty good route to go. It's, it's a, you know, non-invasive to the tree with great benefits. You know, untreated leaves, you can see where they get infected, they brown, they fall off, the tree defoliates. Um, where the treated trees are much greener, much waxier leaf, much more leathery, uh, feels much healthier and uh, is, is a lot healthier. <clears throat> leaf spot diseases. Um, this is just an example of how effective it was on, on Aspen um, out west. But you're gonna have similar, similar reactions out here in the east with, with crab apple. Um, you know, it's not for edible plants. You wouldn't want to use this on an, on an apple tree in an orchard that you're going to eat from, but for crab apples and, and ornamental purposes, um, you know, great resistance to those leaf spot issues. We see really, really good benefits. So another thing that we, uh, we see commonly with plants uh, is chlorosis, uh, which is an iron deficiency. And that's could be due to the pH of the soil being wrong or just a lack of iron availability. And, and this is a great, not a great, but this is a real predisposition that, that can drive trees uh, down into the poor health status. Other things that can look like chlorosis would be soil compaction, waterlogged soils, you know, some insect and mite infestations can stipple the leaves and make it look like chlorosis. Um, but if you're dealing with an actual, you know, the actual iron deficiency, there's, there's a lot of things we can do about that immediately before we start changing that soil um, composition to, to change it permanently. So when the pH of the soils where the trees are, are healthy, you can see that's, you know, um, you know, where iron's available. If it gets too um, base, you know, too, the clay soils are typically in the, that higher pH scale. And that's where iron becomes unavailable. So here's what we have. We have um, Minja Effie is a product we have, which is an injectable iron. Um, and you can see here year over year, you know, August to July, you know, just amazing results on this. And this was combined um, plant growth regulator and an injection of iron. You know, it was a parking lot tree, um, poor growing conditions. So that's where the growth regulator was great, but it was also, you know, very chlorotic. So the iron injection was, was a very good idea for that also. Um, and if you do these iron injections in the fall, you can get two or three years out of, uh, out of one injection of, of, of great benefit to the tree. And that gives you three years to start amending that soil and working with it to try to get that iron a little more naturally available. Um, and if it's a situation where you just can't, because pH is pretty hard to uh, bring down permanently in soils, then, you know, maybe you have to inject it again every three years, but you're going you're gonna to resolve that chlorotic problem. <clears throat> so here's a couple more before and afters, um, you know, August to July, year over year. Extremely, extremely beneficial. Here is a uh, pin oak year over year. Um, June to June. And you can see, you know, with that iron d deficiency and, uh, you know, just all those issues that's dragging that tree down. Once you apply a plant growth regulator and inject the iron, uh, you know, you get the, the double dose of the uh, more efficient chlorophyll, the thicker leaf tissue, increased fine hair root growth, uh, decreased outward growth, and, and the iron. Um, great, great results. So here we have two trees side by side. One's going to be treated, one's not. And you can see kind of how they progress over the, uh, over the years as one, one becomes healthier and the other just uh, continues to decline. So you can see from 17, both kind of ratty. And by 19, that tree on the right is just, 
you know, really sad. But that left tree, that's, that's, that's a real good looking tree now. <clears throat> so that, those are all combinations of, of the MinJet FE and the shortstop. Um, you know, it, it just really is a great combination. The two of those together when you have chlorosis um, works amazing. If you don't have chlorosis and the tree's just in decline, the growth regulator is really what you need. But when you have both, that combination can uh, turn some trees around that you would never expect to, to have another chance at life. The considerations for it um, is you can, you can do it in the spring or early summer uh, with the iron injections, but you have to use a lower rate if you do it in the earlier season. It can be phytotoxic at a, at a higher rate when you do it at that time of year. So we do recommend that you do this in the fall because that's when you can get the higher rate in the tree. You get a lot longer residual. And uh, you know that's where you get those, those, those longer benefits. So chlorosis doesn't typically drop a tree instantly. Um, if you have a tree and you, you go there in late spring, early summer, and it has that, that classic yellowing chlorotic look, you know, if you can just hold off till fall and get that better treatment in there, you know, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll be thankful for it. <clears throat> so the shortstop, um, as a couple different ways you can apply it, you can either use um, a soil probe to inject it four to six inches deep around the base of the tree, um, or you can do a moat and a soil drench. So you can dig, dig just a little, uh, you know, moat a couple inches out from the trunk. Um, do a little kind of like a root crown excavation almost, you know, right there at the base and, and um, just pour it right in there. But the main thing is to apply it evenly around the base of the tree so it can get taken up evenly throughout the tree. So here you can see with, with the injections, you want to space those injections, you know, every, uh, every six or eight inches around the base of the tree and about four to six inches deep, you know, evenly distributed. Um, or you dig that shallow furrow about two to five inches deep and just kind of drench it around the base of the tree. Here's an example of the label. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very inclusive of, of many, many species of trees. Uh, but this is the important part to look at when you're using growth regulators. You can't over-regulate trees. Um, if you were to use the high rate of 200 mil solution per inch on a Japanese maple, the leaves are probably going to come out the size of your pinky and that, that tree could even, could, even, um, could even die from it. So you do have to follow the label. The label's the law. Um, but given that, you can see it's, it's kind of um, you know, almost intuitive. If you're looking for which tree and which category it's going to be in, you know the aggressive growing trees. Silver maples are obviously on the higher end of the, the, um, the ratio than you know, an Australian pine or something. So you know, Japanese maples grow very slow. They don't need a lot of regulation. Same with dogwoods. Um, you know, so those faster growing trees need the higher rate for the effect. <clears throat> So always follow the label so you don't end up doing more harm than good. And our newer labels do have all those updated rates. <clears throat> so here's a situation though where, you know, that tree is gonna be in decline. Obviously, you know, girdling roots are, are something you have to deal with. But when it comes to customers' expectations, you know, here's a situation where, you know, you probably wouldn't wanna promise the world with a tree like this. It's a good idea to use, you know, a growth regulator do the root pruning on this tree, take the stress off it, kind of slow down that growth and, and stop it from constricting itself more in the future. Because this scenario here, you really wouldn't be able to cut all of those girdling roots at the surface or that, you know, that tree would have to be, uh, you know, removed most likely. So, you know, having those proper expectations for the customer that not all situations can be solved um, is a good way to start off. <clears throat> you know, here we have a tree um, in pretty hard decline. And this is where, you know, yeah, a growth regulator would be a good idea on this to kind of slow down that growth, try to get the uh, health back, but it's better preventatively. You know, as soon as you did that construction project, the growth regulator should have been applied. You know, three, four years down the road when it's showing that stress is often pretty far down the rabbit's hole to bring those trees back. Um, worth a shot when they're, uh, you know, significant trees or of, you know, importance to the homeowner but always the, the therapeutic is gonna give you much better results. And you do have to apply it properly. If you pour a plant growth regulator meant for a tree on grass, it's gonna kill the grass. So, you know, dig the moat, pour it around the base of the tree, but don't, don't just pour it on the grass around the tree or it's just gonna kill all the grass. So here's an example of, of when you would use a plant growth regulator preventatively and, and kind of how it plays out in the real world. 
So a lot of times homeowners will call concerned about their trees after construction nearby. So, you know, they're going to call and say, you know, I had a new driveway put in near my trees. You know, I'd, I'd like, I'd like to have something done. I want to make sure they don't get too stressed out by that. So right off the right off the right out of the gate, we can ask them, you know, how big are the trees? You know, how, how tall are they? Um, what kind of work was done? You know, kind of do that, that information fishing that we have to do on every call when a customer calls in at first to kind of know what the plan might be before we even go. So in this scenario, we know that they put a driveway in within the you know critical root zone of these trees. And this is from the uh, best management practice for tree protection and contractors and builders. And you can see a 10 inch diameter tree. If you do construction within 15 feet of that tree, you're in the critical root zone and possibly doing some, some stress to that. So, you know, having those best management practices to explain to customers why something should be done now, even though that tree doesn't look bad is, you know, damage was done, but trees are very good at, at storing energy and using it slowly, hoping for a better day. So the goal is to not make them expend all that energy till they actually start physically declining. <clears throat> and here's a, another good chart to have from that, that same best management guide is the structural distance to trees and construction. So if you have a eight inch diameter tree and they do construction within five feet of it, you can, you can do um, structural damage. So that's, that's how, you know, if you can stay outside these numbers, that's the best place to be. You can, you can work with the health if you have to, but inside these numbers are where, where structural problems start to happen. <clears throat> so once we get there, you know, this is what the homeowners usually say. Um, they'd like to say, hey, you know, let's, let's fertilize these trees. Uh, damage was done. We, we took out some roots. Let's feed them. Uh, but that's the last thing we should do. Uh, the International Society of Arboriculture, the ISA, put out a paper in 2011 that fertilization should be limited immediately following construction. A lot of the salts associated with quick release nitrogen and fertilizers can draw water even out of the tree. And once you have that limited root zone uh, due to the damages, you know, that salt drawing out any water is just going to really um, exacerbate the problem. So you do not want to fertilize trees immediately following construction unless there's a soil test performed and it, and it does need something. So that's when you would explain that a plant growth regulator would be a better idea to just let the tree naturally try to balance out, um, deal with its issues you know, internally, so to say, um, and not add those fertilizers, which can make the problem worse. I've seen some construction projects where, you know, people went in, fertilized the tree, and a month later, the tree drops dead. It just, it just wipes them out if you uh, do it inappropriately. <clears throat> Again, that's because we're taking down that shoot growth and, and increasing that fine root growth to repair that damage. So growth control on different things, um, you can see just they fight, dis fight disease, save money, safety just in not having to prune so often, um, you know, a lot of benefits from this. But weak trees do get sick and that's something that has to be addressed before we can get to all the, uh, the soil amendments and everything. So usually because the call is that the tree got sick, this is where we have to start. Um, so the common issues associated with stress, you get two line chestnut borer, bronze birch borer, phytophthora, uh, die back, poor compartmentalization. You know, these are what we have to deal with first and then start working with the soil. <clears throat> so phosphoget is something we have. It's um, a phosphorous acid. And this is a great product for increasing resistance, thickened cell walls, uh, makes, them, makes them much less suitable host for, uh, for fungi. It's great for armillary root rot uh, and things of that nature. <clears throat> So it works for, you know, Phytophthora, Apple Scab, Fire Blight. So like a year one might be to do this and the plant growth regulator. And then when the plant growth regulator kicks in for, you know, that scab the next year, you wouldn't have to worry about it. But it'll let you solve the problem immediately and then get into those uh, preventative and, uh, you know, preventative therapeutic mixture of treatments to get out of that spiral. Propozole is another uh, fungicide that we have. So this can be, you know, injected for sycamore anthracnose, uh, Dutch Elms disease. Dutch Elms disease, culturally, you can't really do much to avoid that. You have to prevent it. But, you know, with the sycamore anthracnose, as we discussed earlier, you know, we could take care of it with this and do the uh, plant growth regulator. And then the next year, we don't have to worry about it. We can just rely on that growth regulator. So this, you know, infected um, leaf incidence, you can see, is greatly reduced by the, uh, the use of the propoconazole. And then you know, the uh, paclobutrazole takes over after that. <clears throat> you 
Triage G4, this is what we would recommend for the boring insects. Um, Two-line chestnut borer in the Northeast here, that insect made a huge, huge resurgence in the last couple of years because of the stress brought on by gypsy moth and drought. Um, so those predisposed it to, to this boring insect. So this would help mitigate that issue, control that boring insect, then we can get the health of the tree back. It's also gonna work against gall wasps, caterpillars, conifer mites. Um, you know, you see mites in a lot of conifers when, when the area is a little too hot, too dry. You know, if you plant a lot of uh, arborvitaes right along a driveway, it's gonna be dusty, dry, and hot. And you're gonna have a lot more mites on, on trees in that area. So, you know, you might have to work with the mites for a while, but then the preventative issue with that, maybe plant a side, a shade tree, you know, 30 feet away or somewhere to make sure they're not full sun baking all day long. You're still getting enough sun to survive, but not that blazing sun all day. <clears throat> um, but most importantly, I see um, is, is we have to know the benefits of trees to save them. Because a lot of times it's, it's convincing the customers and knowing why trees are worth saving that gets us to do this work. Because therapeutic work, I mean, preventative work is seen as putting money into a problem that doesn't exist. You know, first we have to explain how it's, it's a small, small steering of the wheel now to avoid major adjustments later and say these little inputs now can save us from big problems. You know, and here's why these trees are important. Uh, the benefits of trees financially, trees, trees add a lot of value to our property. They lower electric bills, um, lower stormwater mitigation costs. You know, a lot of financial incentives to having mature trees. Um, homeowners don't understand that trees are saving the money sometimes until it's Till they're gone, then they get the then they foot the bill they weren't used to paying. Uh, but other than that, there's um, local business does a lot better when there's trees. Um, it slows traffic. So on a main downtown Main Street on a, in a given town, the more tree canopy they have, the better small businesses will do. Uh, you know, in the summer when it's hot, if there's no trees, people are just are rushing through. If it's comfortable and shade, people are going to hang out longer, and and you do see a lot more uh, a lot more shopping. Um, ADHD. Uh, it can lower the prevalence of that. Uh, they did this test with children and, and going out to parks versus going into the city to try to reduce the stress. And, you know, when they took a 20 minute walk in a park or in the forest, you know, those levels of stress came way down in those children. They were to learn much better uh, versus, you know, children that just spent all their time in classrooms and city environments. So it allows people to learn better. Um, prevalence of asthma goes way down. With trees, if you grow up in a polluted urban area with, with no, no trees, you're far more likely to develop asthma as a child, which is a lifelong problem. Whereas if you grew up in that uh, same area with, with good tree canopy, you know, they see a lot less prevalence of, of that issue. Crime is greatly reduced. Um, a 10% increase in tree canopy was associated with a 12% decrease in crime. And um, in a minute, we'll talk about how, why most likely that crime came down. Um, heart disease goes up when tree canopy goes down. This was able to be studied finally because um, of emerald ash borer. Um, in Chicago area, where a lot of those uh, trees were killed initially and, and they deforested all those areas, all those trees that had to get cut down, uh, <clears throat> heart disease went up by 25%. There was a lot more, you know, just cardiopulmonary disease issues, cardiovascular issues, you know. So trees keep us healthy in ways we don't even understand. Once they leave, we see these, these ill effects. The healing properties of trees. Uh, <clears throat> just being able to see one in a hospital, they, they see makes you heal faster. VAs that are being built now, they build with parks and benches where you can walk and just they, they, reducing that stress levels and, and lowering blood pressure that, that, that trees have on, you know, our, that effect on us, you know, helps us heal faster, whether that's physical or emotional um, healing. But here's why um, it helps reduce crime is, is, is increased socializing. So in, in inner city areas where there's no trees, you don't see a lot of people going outside. But when you have a planted park, um, people tend to go out. They, wanna, they play in the park. Uh, they have that shade. They'll have picnics. And then they start to meet their neighbors. Um, the more you know your neighbors, the more likely you are to look out for each other. So with that increased socializing, um, this, this area when they, like, they planted one area versus the other had no trees, there was 50% fewer crimes in the apartment blocks that had trees. It's because these, these people started to know each other. They looked out for each other. Um, you know, if you don't know what your neighborhood is up to, you don't know who's who, you don't know what, when something's wrong, possibly. You know, if you know your neighbor is just a quiet, live alone person, 
and you hear some a lot of loud noises, you know something's wrong. If you don't know who your neighbor is and you hear loud noises, you could just assume that they have a lot of children or something. So the socializing aspect of trees reduces crime greatly. It reduces stress, again, which is why it helped with ADHD, but that also lowers cortisol in people. Um, cortisol is one of the main reasons people uh, gain and retain weight. So, you know, by going for a walk in the woods, you also reduce stress, but by lowering cortisol, it has that double effect of not just working out, but also lowering the stress. So, you know, running on a treadmill in a gym is not going to have the same effect as running or hiking in the forest where you can also lower your stress. <clears throat> the cooling aspect of trees. Um, you can reduce the temperature of a city by as much as 10 degrees Fahrenheit with proper canopy. Um, and that proper canopy is uh, tree cover must exceed about 40% to have good benefits from, um, from trees on cooling. And, you know, this is big in, in Europe. Um, there's not a lot of, there's not air conditioning in Europe like there is in the United States. So they're, they're much more uh, attuned to the uh, canopy cover to, to the cooling effects. Because there you see a lot of elderly people um, start to die when they have heat waves. Um, and that's because they don't, they don't do air conditioning like we do in these cities. And it's important to not have to use it as much. I mean, that's just an energy waste. If we can plant trees, get all the benefits of the tree and cool it so we don't have to use as much electricity on, on uh, air conditioning, you know, even better. Stormwater retention. Um, a large tree, this is the, not a large tree, this is just kind of an average tree, but a tree with a 33 foot crown, I believe in this study, uh, retains 332 gallons of water. So that's a lot of, uh, a lot of water that the city is not going to have to deal with. You know, having mature trees is going to mitigate all that from going into the, uh, into the sewer system and having to be treated. Uh, same thing on your property, having those trees, you're going to have a, um, not as many problems with flooding when you have, uh, you know, mature trees or erosion. So, you know, with all these different benefits trees have that people don't really think of all these little benefits that they give to us. Um, and putting all those together really makes it important to do those um, preventative treatments and in-plant in healthcare and, and keep them away from those, um, that inner part of the spiral where they're gonna, gonna start to have the boring insects, root rots and, and those things that really do kill them. So that wraps up my uh, presentation on Preventative plant health care, and um, thank you. If you have any questions, I can uh, take them now.